Hey, 42 here. Napoleon Bonaparte is known to history as the brilliant military leader who led his armies to several prominent victories during the French Revolutionary Wars. But just as famous as his military prowess is his diminutive stature, a trait which more recently inspired the idea of the Napoleon Complex, the sense of inferiority felt by some short men which is typically compensated for through increased aggression, heightened competitiveness, and general arseholiness. This is how it works for humans, at least, but this inverse relationship between size and a friendly disposition could just as easily be applied in the animal kingdom. After all, some of nature's smallest creatures are also the biggest bastards. Meet the Lancet liver fluke. This little bundle of joy, a species of parasitic flatworm, starts out life as an egg nestled snugly in the dung of a grazing animal like a cow or sheep. Not the best way to enter the world, admittedly. I mean, if your introduction to the world was being extruded out of a cow's arsehole, you'd probably also grow up to be a rather contemptuous creature. The as yet unhatched flukes wait it out in their dirty nests until their first host, the terrestrial snail, happens to slide over. Once eaten by a snail, the flukes make their way from the gut towards the lungs, where they are eventually coughed up in the form of a slime ball. It just so happens that ants are rather partial to a spot of slime, and it's when the lancet liver flukes find themselves in the belly of an ant that they earn themselves a serious promotion, going from relatively harmless stowaway to captain of the whole damn ship. Because once inside an ant, a fluke will make its way to the brain, where, like the world's tiniest hacker, it slowly but surely takes over. You see, to complete its life cycle, the lancet liver fluke needs to get itself back inside the gut of a grazing animal, the only place where it can reach its adult form. But, just how do you go about getting an ant inside the gut of a grazing animal, even if you do control its brain? If you can't think of an answer to that question, then you are officially less intelligent than a lancet liver fluke. Congratulations. When night falls, the fluke takes control over the hapless ant, steering the little creature not back towards the safety of its burrow, but upwards. No doubt, wondering where the hell its own feet are taking it, the ant will climb a nearby blade of grass or flower stem. When it reaches just the right height, the fluke forces the ant to sink its mandibles into whatever surface it's standing on, fixing it in place. The ant will stay like that, breathing but unable to move for the rest of the night, waiting for a grazing animal to trundle along and gobble it up. If the ant isn't eaten that night, the fluke will recede back into the shadows, releasing the puppet strings and letting the ant go about its regular anti-business, until the next night, and the one after that, until the ant is finally eaten, and the fluke's dastardly plan is accomplished. Zombie ants and mind-controlling worms might sound pretty terrifying. But at least these kinds of parasites could never take control of a large, complex brain like those found in our own skulls, right? Right? Sadly, no. It isn't just ants who need to keep an eye out for parasitic infestations in their slime balls. We do too. Now, when you think of parasites in humans, your mind probably conjures up images of tapeworms, ticks, or Gwyneth Paltrow. Bloodsuckers and bowel dwellers that are undeniably disgusting, but probably not life-threatening. But it turns out there are other, more insidious parasites that are just as bad news for us humans as lancet liver flukes are for ants. Take Nigleria fowleri, for example. Or as it's more commonly known, the brain-eating amoeba. And no, I didn't make that name up. This single-celled eukaryote hangs out in warm bodies of stagnant fresh water like ponds or slow-moving rivers or even swimming pools without enough chlorine. When inhaled through the nose by a human, Nigleria fowleri takes its opportunity, passing into the brain, where it begins, quite literally, chowing down on our grey matter. The body reacts swiftly, sending a swarm of defensive agents to help out the brain. If that sounds reassuring, it shouldn't. 
The roughly 7mm of bone that makes up the human skull is great for protecting our most precious organs from bumps and falls, but it starts to seriously work against us if the mass of neurons and blood inside begins to increase in volume. As the pressure builds, the brain's connection to the spinal cord becomes disrupted and, well, all hell breaks loose. Symptoms of Nigleria Fowleri infection include headache, fever, stiff neck, a loss of appetite, alterations to the sense of taste, blood vision, loss of balance, seizures and hallucinations. Back in 2015, a man from Taiwan managed to stick out this living nightmare for 25 days, but most patients will die within a week. Thankfully, whilst the amoeba itself is relatively common, infections in humans occur only very rarely. Which is great, because since the amoeba was first identified in 1965, around 99% of cases have proven fatal. Which probably shouldn't come as much as a surprise when you consider that this thing actually eats your brain. Next, there's the African sleeping sickness, a condition caused by the parasite Trypanosoma brucei, which makes its way into us humans by way of a bite from a tsetse fly. Once safely inside our bloodstream, the parasite goes about feasting on whatever nutrients it can find there, causing fairly mild symptoms of fever, headaches and joint pain. Sounds like a walk in the park compared to the world's tiniest episode of The Walking Dead that was the Nigleria Fowleri, right? Well, not exactly. From here, Trypanosoma brucei undergoes a series of form changes, eventually reaching a state capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier, a defensive mechanism designed to prevent foreign substances from entering the brain and central nervous system. Having slipped past our defenses, Trypanosoma brucei begins messing about with the very fabric of what makes you, well, you. Symptoms like confusion, personality changes, tremors, sleep disruption, loss of appetite and odd speech patterns soon follow. If left untreated, patients will become slow and unresponsive, eventually lapsing into a sleep from which they will never wake up. Death will soon follow. The next and final lovely parasite I'm delighted to share with you is Toxoplasma gondii and is perhaps the most interesting. Why? Because there's a reasonable chance that you, yes you, watching this video are already infected with it. Estimates vary as to just how much of the human population is currently playing host to a Toxoplasma gondii party, but some studies suggest it could be as much as 30 to 50%. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, you'd better fasten your seatbelt. Remember how the lancet liver fluke takes over the minds of ants? Well, Toxoplasma gondii won't have you climbing trees or trying to get yourself ingested by a cow, but it could change your behaviour in small but significant ways. The Toxoplasma gondii parasite is a particularly adaptable little critter, capable of taking up residence in almost any warm-blooded animal, a trait that's extremely rare amongst parasites. But of all the creatures it can inhabit, there's only one in which it can sexually reproduce. Arguably the most cunning, evil and downright memeable of all the animals on earth, the not so humble cat. Yes, your cat may be carrying a parasite that can alter the way you think. The mad old cat lady is a well-trodden trope that's been around for decades, but it may be more accurate than any of us previously thought. The typical life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii sees it ingested by a small mammal like a rat, usually through contaminated water or droppings. Once inside, Toxoplasma gondii spreads throughout the rat's body, taking up residence pretty much everywhere, but particularly in the brain, where it forms clusters of cysts in areas like the amygdala, which is responsible for the brain's fear response. Here, Toxoplasma gondii whips out its parasitical toolbox and gets busy tinkering, somehow rewiring the brain so that instead of fearing the smell of cat urine, as rats instinctively do, the host rodent becomes sexually attracted to it. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Developing a fetish for cat piss is one hell of a good way to get yourself eaten by a cat. And so, 
the cycle continues. But, as we've heard, Toxoplasma gondii isn't only carried by rats and mice, and it isn't only rodents that are preyed upon by cats. In the jungles of Gabon, for example, chimpanzees are preyed on by leopards, and guess what? Studies have shown that chimps infected with Toxoplasma gondii become morbidly attracted to the scent of leopard urine, making them much more likely to become leopard lunch. And if an animal as complex and large-brained as a chimpanzee can be manipulated by this parasite, it isn't such a stretch to imagine that we might be too. We do share about 99% of the same DNA, after all. Occupying a cosy spot at the top of the food chain, we modern humans represent something of a dead end for the Toxoplasma gondii parasite. It's going to struggle to convince us to be eaten by a cat after all, even if cats do like to try every now and then. But if we go back far enough, we too were prey for big cats like cave lions, saber-toothed cats and false saber-toothed cats. So is Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite infecting billions of people around the world, capable of actually changing our behaviour? Believe it or not, it just might be. Research in this area, though not yet conclusive, has hinted at some startling findings, suggesting that this incredibly common parasite could well have an impact on our appetite for risk, our moods, our reaction times, and even our mental health. One study discovered that students in the US who tested positive for Toxoplasma gondii were 1.4 times as likely to be studying business and 1.7 times as likely to have an educational emphasis in management and entrepreneurship. The same study found that attendees at an entrepreneurship event who tested positive for Toxoplasma gondii were 1.8 times as likely to have started their own business compared to those who tested negative. This trend holds true at the national level too, with countries with high levels of Toxoplasma gondii infections also showing increased entrepreneurial activity. So perhaps your cat could make you a millionaire one day. Then there's the research coming out of Turkey that has shown those carrying Toxoplasma gondii are as much as two and a half times as likely to get into traffic accidents meaning the parasite may be responsible for hundreds of thousands of road deaths worldwide each year. And yet another study that found people with intermittent explosive disorder, which is surprisingly not to do with the bowels, but is a psychiatric condition that leads to sudden outbursts of rage, like road rage, were more than twice as likely to test positive for Toxoplasma gondii. These behaviours are strange indeed, but all seem to be linked to changes in our risk appetite and natural human fear response. We know that Toxoplasma gondii makes mice and chimps less fearful in subtle but important ways, and it looks like it might well be doing something similar to us. There's also growing evidence to suggest that Toxoplasma gondii may be linked to psychological conditions like schizophrenia, with one study suggesting the illness might be two to three times as common in individuals testing positive for the parasite versus the rest of the population. Is it more than just a coincidence then that schizophrenia is thought to have become prominent in the latter half of the 18th century? Right around the time people in Paris and London started keeping cats as pets? I'll let you be the judge of that. But the next time you flip someone the bird when they cut you up on the motorway, or you wake up in the middle of the night with a killer idea and a strange urge to quit your job and found your first startup selling avocados to Mexicans, ask yourself one simple question. Are you really calling the shots, or is it your not so friendly brain fungus? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting me on Patreon because it really helps me to continue to make them. The link's in the description. Also, you can get your hands on a first edition signed copy of my new book, Sticker Flag in It, by heading on over to Unbound, the link's in the description, and pre-ordering your copy today. Thank you.